Benjamin Franklin, Why Some Succeed While Others Fail, by Benjamin Franklin. Possibly there has never lived a man who has excited more comment than has the subject of this narrative, who was born in Boston, January 17, 1706. Now his father was a soap boiler and tallow chandler, and he was the 15th in a family of 17 children. Young Benjamin was expected by his parents to become a minister of the gospel, and for this purpose was placed in school at the age of eight. But the reduced circumstances of his father compelled his return home two years later, and he began the work of cutting wicks in his father's establishment. Afterwards, he was bound to his brother James, who was a printer, where he worked hard all day and often spent half the night in reading. The secret of his great success can be readily perceived when we know that his favorite books were Mather's Essays to Too Good and Defoe's Essays of Projects and many others of a like nature. Instead of the modern three-fingered Jack, Calamity Jane, the Queen of the Plains, or the more refined of today's juvenile reading. When he was about 16, he wrote in a disguised hand an article for his brother's paper. This article was published anonymously and excited great curiosity. Other articles followed. At length, the identity of the author was discovered, and for some unknown reason, the elder brother was offended. From that hour, Benjamin resolved to leave Boston, as his brother's influence was used to his disadvantage in that city. Embarking, he worked his passage to New York, where he arrived at the age of 17 almost penniless and without recommendations. Failing to obtain work here, he continued on to Philadelphia, where he arrived, disappointed but not discouraged. He now had but one dollar and a few copper coins in the world. Being hungry, he brought some, bought some bread, and with one roll under either arm and eating the third, he passed up the street on which his destined wife lived, and she beheld him as he presented this ridiculous appearance. Obtaining employment, he secured board and lodging with Mr. Reed, afterward his father-in-law. Being induced to think of going into business for himself through promises of financial help from influential parties, he sailed to London for the purpose of buying the necessary requisites for a printing office. Well, not until his arrival in that great city of London did he learn of the groundlessness of his hope for aid in the expected quarter. In a strange land, friendless and alone, without money to pay his return passage, such was his predicament. Yet he lost not his courage, but obtained employment as a printer, writing his betrothed that he should likely never return to America. His stay in London lasted, however, about 18 months, during which time he succeeded in reforming some of his beer-drinking companions. In 1826, he returned to America as a dry goods clerk, but at the death of his employer, unfortunately turned his attention once more to his especial calling, and he soon after formed a partnership with a Mr. Meredith. Now, this was in 1728. Miss Reed, during his stay abroad, had been induced to marry another man who had proved to be a scoundrel leaving her to escape punishment for debt, and it is alleged with an indictment for bigamy hanging over his head. Franklin attributed much of this misfortune to himself and resolved to repair the injuries so far as lay within his powder, power. Accordingly, he married her in 1730. Now this proved a most happy union. His business connection with Mr. Meredith being dissolved, he purchased the miserably conducted sheet of Mr. Keimer, his former employer, and under Franklin's management, it became a somewhat influential journal of opinion. It was through this channel that those homely sayings with such rich meanings first appeared in print. His great intelligence, industry, and ingenuity in devising reforms, and the establishment of the first circulating library, soon won for him the esteem of the entire country. 1732 is memorable as the year in which appeared his almanac, in which was published the sayings of the world-famous Poor Richard. This almanac abounded with aphorisms and quaint sayings, the influence of which tended mightily to the economy, and it was translated into foreign languages. In fact, it was the most popular almanac ever printed. After ten years' absence, he returned to his native city of Boston, and his noble instincts were shown as he consolingly promised his dying brother that he would care for his nephew, his brother's son. Returning to Philadelphia, he became postmaster of that city, established a fire department. He becomes a member of the assembly to which office he's elected 10 consecutive years. 
Although he was not an orator, no man wielded more influence over the legislative department than did Franklin. As is well known, he invented the celebrated Franklin stove, which proved so economical, and for which he refused a patent. Well, for years, he entertained the theory that galvanic electricity and that which produced lightning and thunder were identical. But it was not until 1752 that he demonstrated the truth by an original but ingenious contrivance attached to a kite. And to Franklin, we owe the honor of inventing the lightning rod, but not its abuse, which has caused such widespread animosity to that valuable instrument of self-preservation. These discoveries made the name of Franklin respected throughout the scientific world. Forever after this period, during his life, he was connected with national affairs. At one time, he was offered a commission as general in the provincial army, but distrusting his military qualifications, he unequivocally declined. Sir Humphrey Davy said, Franklin seems rather to make philosophy a useful inmate and servant in the common habitations of man than to preserve her merely as an object for admiration in temples and palaces. While it is said of him by some that he always had a keen eye to his own interests, all are forced to add he ever had a benevolent concern for the public welfare. The burdens bearing so heavily upon the colonies, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Georgia, and Massachusetts, appointed Franklin as their agent to the mother country. Arriving in London in 1757, despite his mission, honors awaited him at every turn. There he associated with the greatest men of his time, and the universities of Edinburgh and Oxford honored him with the title of LLD, and the poor journeyman printer of a few years before, now associated with princes and kings. At the end of five years, he returned to America, and in 1762 received the official thanks of the assembly. Well, two years later, he was again sent to England, and he opposed the obnoxious Stamp Act, where he carried himself with decorum and great ability before the entire nobility. Upon his return to America, he was made a member of the assembly the day he landed, where he exerted his whole influence for a Declaration of Independence, and soon after had the pleasure of signing such a document. Now, in 1776, Congress sent him to France, where he became one of the greatest diplomats this country has ever known. During his voyage over, he made observations relative to the Gulf Stream, and the chart he drew of it nearly 100 years ago still forms the basis of maps on the subject. Well, as is well known to Franklin more than all others, are we indebted for the kindly interference by France in our behalf, whose efforts, through, though ineffective in the field, helped the revolutionary cause wonderfully in gaining prestige. At the close of the war, Franklin was one of the commissioners in framing that treaty which recognized American independence. His simple winning ways won for him admiration in any court of embroidery and lace, while his worldwide reputation as a philosopher and a statesman won for him a circle of acquaintances of the most varied character. On the 17th of April, 1790, this great statesman died, and fully 20,000 people followed him to the tomb. Now, the inscription he had designed read, The body of Benjamin Franklin, printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out, and script of its lettering and gilding, lies here food for worms. Yet the work itself shall not be lost, for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more beautiful edition, corrected and amended by the author. Truly, America has been rich in great men, of which Franklin was not the least. Dr. Franklin, in his will, left his native town of Boston the sum of 1,000 pounds to be lent to the young married artificers upon good security and under odd conditions. If the plan should be carried out as successfully as he expected, he reckoned that this sum would amount in 100 years to 131,000 pounds. Well, it was his wish, and so expressed in his will, that 100,000 pounds should be spent upon public works which may then be judged of the most general utility to the inhabitants, such as fortifications, bridges, aqueducts, public buildings, baths, pavements, or whatever makes living in the town more convenient to its people and renders it more agreeable to strangers resorting thither for health or temporary residence. It was also his wish that the remaining 31,000 pounds should again be put upon interest for another 100 years, at the end of which time the whole amount was to be divided between the city and the state. Now, the bequest at the end of the first 100 years may not attain the exact figure he calculated, but it's sure to be a large sum. 
At the present time, it is more than $175,000 and has many years yet to run.